All right, so thank you everyone for joining us today. We have um, Dr. Duick, who is going to be speaking on his presentation, Staying Human in Medicine. Just want to thank you all again for coming for our final session for obliquity. Um, and just information about Dr. Duick, he is a primary care physician who also works in emergency medicine and addictions medicine. So whenever you're ready, Dr. Duick, you can begin. All right, well, so and thanks a lot for the invitation to speak today. Um, I know this is the last session of the, this year, so uh, thanks everyone for coming. And uh, I guess I'll also will acknowledge it. Thank you for uh, uh, Dr. Van Ness for connecting with uh, Ashka to you know, kind of set this up. It's been uh, very, very nice to have the opportunity to speak a bit about uh, staying human in medicine. Um, as I said, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Kevin Duick. I am uh, associated with uh, Western University's uh, Schulich School of uh, Medicine and Dentistry as an adjunct professor. Um, next slide, please. I am presenting from an iPad, so I've not found a good way to share screen. So uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, presenter disclosures, uh, I'm not sponsored by anybody to be here. Um, I, I might mention some fountain pens and things like that. Uh, I don't have any financial relationships with the fountain pen industry um, either. So next slide. So uh, yeah, so I'm, this is this, this little uh, thing. So like I said, uh, thanks for having me over here to, to talk a bit about uh, you know art and uh, creativity and uh, staying human in the, the journey we have through medical training, medical practice, and uh, the challenges that brings with it. So uh, next slide. So a bit bit about me. So um, actually, as of tomorrow, I'm entering my fourth year of practice. Uh, today was the 31st of uh, March. Three years ago is when I first uh, set foot in the emergency room in Tilsonburg, where I still work. Uh, it's a rural emergency uh, with single physician coverage. So it's basically you and uh, nursing staff, and uh, there's an internist, there's a hospitalist, and uh, that's it. Oftentimes during the night, it's just you taking care of the whole hospital because every code, everything upstairs goes through you first. So it's quite a, quite, quite a thing to do. Uh, I'm also in a uh, primary care uh, doc at the uh, CHC, so Community Health Centre. I know this is more of an Ontario thing, but uh, basically CHCs are uh, organizations that serve uh, high needs populations. So we have, we have longer periods of time with each patient, but we also have a lot of supports like social workers, a dietitian, physiotherapy, uh, counselors, uh, housing workers, all under the same roof to support people. And uh, underneath that CHC umbrella, I am the physician lead for our uh, RAM clinic, so uh, Rapid uh, Access Addiction Medicine which launched in the fall of uh, 2019. So I've been there for since the foundations were laid and it's been uh, exciting to see that project grow. Um, in terms of a little more about me, I grew up in Southern Ontario. I've lived in the West Coast, lived in the prairies, came back to my MD at Western after doing a, a master's of medical microbiology uh, at uh, University of Manitoba, got a medicine residency up at Brampton through McMaster. Um, and uh, interestingly, I think prior to med school, I was more on the, uh, very scientific side, uh, you know, not really the humanities person. Um, but uh, over time, I started, you know, writing short stories, poetry. I had a blog. It's not not really updated for much these days, but uh, my work collected on there. Uh, did some art pieces in graphic medicine um, in medical school. I connected with uh, Dr. Je Dr. Jeff Misker, who's in uh, OB Gyn over at Western and very active in uh, health humanities. And he mentored me during my time there and then afterwards. Um, I think since 2012, I have uh, about 25 or 26 publications in health humanities uh, and, and a lot of unpublished work that is some of it's personal, some of it's just I've tried and no one wants it, but that's how it goes when you're creating things. And uh, that's my blog at the bottom. There is a tab at the top that has a publication list. Some of them are unfortunately now dead websites, uh, but most of them are still active. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, art and uh, creation, and I'm going to be talking more about you know, art as the creator of the art, as a, a creative expression. So writing, poetry, music, sculpture, drawings, you know, all, all these different ways that people can express themselves. Uh, and uh, I, I'm talking about art in terms of being able to process the events that we we go through, uh, explore feelings, uh, personal expression. Um, I know a lot of us as children might have drawn or created or you know made up songs, things like that. But oftentimes as we grow and through schooling, uh, you know, rather than doing creative writing, you do the uh, 
five paragraph uh, hamburger style essays, uh, things like that. And uh, things are very formalized. And uh, sometimes that creative uh, instinct is lost over time. And uh, sometimes uh, these creative expressions can be something that you share, um, but oftentimes they're can be private as well. Um, something I'm not going to cover in this uh, lecture are uh, kind of using art and creating, uh, using art as kind of a, an instrumental value in terms of um, the, like the Art of Seeing course, where we, you analyze paintings and learn uh, art critique principles in order to be a better dermatologist or a better uh, diagnostic observations. I'm also not talking about uh, narrative medicine, like at Columbia, where you're learning all the literary analysis techniques to understand uh, the elements of story and to help you be more reflective and understand the patient's story and uh, have more awareness or empathy. Um, although I think these things are important and they're very interesting uses of art, that's not really the focus of what I'm talking about today. Uh, next page. So a little bit about my journey in terms of, of writing. Um, so I started writing more consistently at the end of my master's. I was gifted a fountain pen. Um, that's a Visconti Homo sapien, if anyone's curious what that thing is over there. It's a very nice pen, actually. <laughs> um, so I, I got this nice pen and I figured, well, why not start journaling, uh, use the pen? And uh, I found that it was a great way to, to mark time to you know, explore feelings, just, you know, mark, mark the day, you know, thoughts in my mind. And uh, it was something I've can, done pretty consistently since well, 2011 to the present. Uh, I'd say the majority of days, I, I you know, write half a page or a page of, of something. If anyone read my journal, it would be the most boring thing on earth, most likely, but it's, it's something that I, you know, was a uh, smoke that I was doing. But then I got into blogging. So I started a blog, The Boot Medicine. And no, it's not a typo. It's It was a joke to myself about being Canadian. Um, so uh, this the blog started in terms of when I applied to medical school. So initially it was observations about, you know, interviews about, uh, you know, when I get in about the, the class about uh, just certain thoughts or and, and, and it was more technical, more about the, the process of getting in. But over time, it, uh, it changed and it moved to be uh, more creative, more about narratives, more, uh, more art. And uh, I'll talk a bit about that during this, this talk about how that changed. So, next slide. So this, this is a quote from uh, John Berryman in one of his interviews. Um, I don't know if people know him. He's a, a poet, an uh, American poet, who uh, one of his the dream songs won the uh, Pulitzer and then a larger collection of dream songs uh, won, also won the, uh, the National Book Prize or Poetry Prize. So he's a well-known guy. But anyway, in one of his uh, interviews, he's talking about uh, American artists and he says, listen, art is created out of ordeal and crisis. Um, so I won't get into the full details of my own experiences, but uh, during early in medical school, where you're often being encultured about you know, what it means to be a doctor, um, about lessons, um, about medicine, uh, we had uh, dean's lectures really come in and tell, tell about their careers and about, uh, you know, what they've learned throughout their careers and uh, lessons they want to impart to new students. And during that enculturation process, um, I was involved in a number of medical um, encounters, uh, not person, but with family members. And many of these encounters left me quite uh, disappointed in the uh, medical culture and the care that was uh, received. And I felt that that gave me a different perspective and kind of prompted a different sensitivity to the uh, interactions I had with patients or the you know, comments some colleagues would make, things like that. And it seemed to coincide with a shift in my, uh, the focus of my blog and uh, my writing. Uh, next page. So uh, I'm going to read, this is the first uh, piece that actually got published externally. Um, this is based off an experience at the end of my first year of medical school. We do a thing called Discovery Week, and I was uh, working with a uh, rural doctor. So just let me pull it up. So um, at the end of my first year of medical school, I spent a few days shadowing Dr. S in a small rural hospital. He was one of the younger doctors in the hospital, spending time in both the family medicine practice and in the emergency department. We had a sim many similarities. Both of us studied microbiology before entering medicine and had recently started families. We bonded through these commonalities, leading to my being granted some independence and in seeing patients and taking histories. Between patients, he stood in the office, gently swaying back and forth, sharing with me his love of medicine. During one short break, he proudly shared a few pictures of his infant daughter. He mentioned that he had recently dropped his workload from 115 hours a week to 65, with further reductions planned. I was surprised that he had had such a workload until recently and proceeded to ask what had happened to leading to this change. 
Quote, a colleague of mine, also working 100 hours a week, came into the work crying one morning, Dr. S stated. When I asked him why he was crying, he said that that morning his four-year-old daughter had approached him and asked, Daddy, where do you live? I could see that just retelling the story caused him to well up. He blinked away a few tears. I gave an understanding nod. Nothing more was said on it, and we went on to see the next patient. So for me, this was a very touching story, and also that I had such commonalities with this practicing doctor. It really hit me hard in terms of the importance of a family, of balance, and not losing sight of what those important parts of life. Next, next page. So in medicine, training isn't easy. There's many le lectures and all these you know, hoops you have to jump through, you know, OSCEs, things like that. Um, and it doesn't stop in, with, with medical school. I know, you know, competing for residency spots, competing for fellowships. Um, there's also challenges in terms of the day-to-day, -day, like difficult patient encounters. Um, you know, you, sometimes you feel you've done, you've gone above and beyond for someone and, uh, you know, they, there's no, no, there's no voicing of appreciation. There's, you know, they're actually frustrated with you. Um, we encounter suffering and have a, a window into people's lives that may, very, very few have. And uh, that can lead to secondary trauma. And also, you know, burnout, burnout levels were pretty bad before COVID and now they're way up in the last two years if you look at recent surveys. So having some means to process these events that we deal with is important. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I'm not discounting the systemic issues that, that, that contribute to, to burnout, that contribute to the, the challenges that we face, understaffing, um, you know, residency hours, uh, you know, call schedules, uh, things like that. I, I'm not discounting that at all, but I, I do think on the personal level that there are ways that we can help ourselves process these events and, uh, you know, even and learn about ourselves and grow um, through the processing. Next page. So, when we're uh, in going into a patient encounter, we're entering their lives, you know, we're absorbing and reflecting and integrating to that story. As soon as we're help, helping to co-create that story, like, you know, how, how we ask the questions, the referrals, the, you know, advice we give. Um, and, you know, oftentimes we're validating people's experiences, their losses, and it requires, you know, engagement, attention, and, uh, you know, affiliation with the patient. And, it you know, we, this is drawing on the work of a uh, Dr. Verghese, um, but, uh, you know, well, we can go to the next page, but, but, but it's more like we're, we're part of the story and it's, it's, you can't escape that in being involved in people's lives as a physician. Uh, next page. So we get many experiences as a doctor. So like with patients, so, you know, your first history, you know, it takes a long time. There's, you know, the encounter, what's said and what's not said, um, the, the outcomes, good, bad, you know, suboptimal. You're also dealing with the experiences with with families, family meetings. Uh, you know, talking with power, powers of attorney, proxies. Um, there's the experiences with coworkers, uh, with peers, the, the stresses in certain groups, expectations. Uh, you know, gossip, and also, also there's a larger experience of kind of the overall culture of the social media organizations, government. So there's a lot that we're dealing with in, in medicine, not just at the patient counter directly, but the uh, surrounding uh, features of, of the industry practice. Next slide. And, uh, you know, we witnessed a lot of suffering, like I'm an emergency doctor and, you know, early on, if you might say, oh, wow, this is really exciting, you know, doing resuscitations, you know, intubations, um, but you, you're seeing people, a lot of people in the worst days of their lives, like you, you know, and if someone's down for a long time, the chances of getting them back are, are slim, but families often expect, oh, they got to the hospital, they're going to be all right. And it's, it's hard going back to that quiet room and talking with family and giving them the news. Like that's difficult things to see or seeing someone who looks sim is similar age to yourself or has uh, features resembling a family member. It can be difficult seeing the um, suffering of others at times. Um, especially, you know, I'm, a, I'm someone who has young children. So, you know, kids can, with, with uh, having major accidents or illnesses can be, you know, difficult to see. And obviously you gotta do your job and, you know, you know, assess them and, you know, do the best you can, but it, it can be difficult. And also sometimes, sometimes there's issues along the lines of uh, like moral distress. So you know what's right, but um, you're somehow prevented to do so due to barriers, due to, uh, you know, being in a rural hospital, not having resources and, you know, knowing that things could be better or, you know, you certain drugs aren't stocked, certain places, things like that. So there can be this distress about, I know what needs to be done, but I'm prevented by some structural issue that I can't do it. And also there, there's uh, issues of, 
you know, you're dealing with this uh, suffering, but you know, you're, you're a doctor, you know, like in uh, the Patch Adams movie, it's like, we're not, you know, who would trust a human to treat you? you we're gonna make something better, doctors. <laughs> so um, there's this uh, secondary trauma that uh, is present in medicine that uh, often not, not uh, acknowledged. So, next slide. So how to deal with these experiences? It's, it's a difficult path. We see often awful things. Um, so I'm gonna draw a bit on uh, behavioral psychology. So I think we've probably covered a bit of that in, in medical school. Um, you know, you can denial, you can, uh, you know, uh, blow things off, but some of the more mature defense mechanisms are along lines of using humor, altruism and sublimation. And one quote about sublimation that I thought kind of encapsulated it well in terms of sublimation as creating something of, out of an experience was that uh, sublimation is a matter of transformation rather than repression. Through stylistic or artistic gifts can the very pain of living at times be converted into valuable experiences. Positive impulses engage the evil and put it to, its, to their own ends, fastening onto its pictorial, dramatic, heroic, lyric, or even comic aspects. Uh, that's from Peter Zatfa, The Last Messiah. Um, it, it's an interesting, essay, it's, it's an essay he wrote, it was published in 1933. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with, uh, oh, I'm not raising my hand, I think it's, <laughs> okay. Uh, it's an interesting essay about uh, human consciousness and uh, in which, well, it's kind of dark, but he uh, actually uh, advocates for antinatalism. But, uh, so if you're interested in something like that, uh, check it out, it's, it's not that long and there's a, a good reading of it that's about half an hour long on YouTube. Okay, next. Oh, I guess this, this slide, I forgot it's, oh, there we go. So in terms of these experiences that we've had, oftentimes things happen fast. We, you know, it's hard to recollect all the parts of an event or you know, certain things stick out and what, what was the meaning of what happened? Um, so art can be a way to you know, process those disjointed experiences, uh, trying to try and dig into what was the meaning or, you know, my reactions, what did that mean? Um, and uh, through doing that, you can, it, it can be part of, you know, developing yourself, your, your identity, your, you know, your personal uh, development. And uh, for me, writing has been one way to, to do that because uh, writing does force you to, you know, put it on a page to organize uh, your words in a, in a logical format. Um, it, there's some you know, a bit ability to have a timeline there, and you can probe into things. And uh, sometimes things just are on your mind and bugging you, and it's hard to, you know, articulate them and be able to have an outlet, whether it's writing or art. It, it can uh, get it out of get out and have it externalized and uh, let you uh, move forward. Also, if you do decide to share uh, these creations, sometimes you could you find that there's some commonality you didn't realize that between you and others, and uh, that can be important as well. So uh, next slide. And uh, in the work of uh, one palliative care nurse that I work with, uh, your work causes suffering in you. So you must have some way to deal with that suffering that you, you see. So next. So uh, this was one of my uh, early, earlier pieces. Um, this is Latin. Uh, it, it, there's a classic teaching phrase in uh, medicine called see one, do one, teach one. So this is see, do and teach in Latin. Um, and I, I didn't think that that short uh, pithy phrase really took into account the, that our learning involves people and their suffering. And um, so this was uh, in Latin, I got someone to translate that for me and I found a uh, ink that look, was called ox blood that looked very much like blood and I picked up a nice calligraphy pen and after a few attempts, I got, got something close to what I'd envisioned in my, in my mind. and. Um, yeah, so this is a learning from experience, a, uh, an early kind of graphic medicine piece that I did. Next. So I, I talked about art, but you can also have, in a way, use uh, what you see in terms of uh, creation, creating something as uh, uh, to address an issue. So there is creativity in, in forming a project or, uh, or you know, creating something to address a, a need. So one other thing that I did in, in medical school was uh, I founded a th thing called the Western Vitals. So um, we know a few of us noticed just in, in, in general that uh, people were really struggling with, uh, you know, with balance, with mental health, with the stresses of, of medical training. And 
about a month and a half into medical school, one of the, my study group members uh, dropped out just due to life stresses. He wasn't able wasn't able to cope with the, the studying and balancing, you know, home, home issues. Uh, you know, basically, he'd lived at, at home for a lot of his life with his his parents helping out a lot with uh, daily, acti daily activities, and uh, was quite stressed having to you know, cook and clean up and laundry. And it might sound silly but no it really stressed him out and he also previously had been a uh, you know top of the class and when you're in medical school you know if it's certain subjects someone's got a phd in that before they get there and you won't be the top and uh, dealing with that was also difficult for this person and they draw back a year and uh, and seeing that uh, realized that, that there was a, was a gap our uh, online our websites um, had a gap in terms of the resources specific for med students and I gathered a team, applied for funding, and we created this thing called Western Vitals, which uh, took on the voice of about a, a, a kind of mature third year medical student who was kind of trying to mentor a, a younger student, uh, giving advice in terms of uh, life and school, wellness, self-care, and, and crisis resources. And we uh, created this hub that had, we didn't create our own resources, but we gathered and, um, what's it called? Sorry, I'm, I'm missing a word in my, my, my brain, but uh, that's fine. So we, we gathered and curated, is what I meant to say, um, the resources for specific for medical students. We uh, met with uh, groups to perform specific workshops for medical students. And uh, it, was, it was actually a, a really nice creative endeavor in terms of, we, you know, we saw an issue, saw a gap, and uh, created this, this thing to help people. And uh, it, it got some attention and uh, was very well received from... Uh, from our side and uh, you know, little things like the graphics or the, the, the name or things like that like there's a lot of creative elements that went into making this uh, something that would uh, appeal to the, to the students so next so there's many ways to create um yeah next, next. You can, there okay um so i think it's become a bit more prevalent these days but there are a lot of medical memoirs uh people are putting out uh kind of sharing more of their experiences so um, I don't think it was as common previously, but I think in the last, you know, I started medical school 10 years ago, and I don't think it was as prevalent as it is now. Um, the Family Doc Diary is a graphic medicine diary of uh, the per person's first year in, in family medicine. Um, Hidden Lives is a, a group of uh, essays, uh, people's experiences with uh, mental health. And uh, yeah, so in Stroke Insights, obviously about a doc a person having a stroke. Um, <laughs> next. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk a little about graphic medicine. So graphic medicine is uh, comics, um, art, and it, it can be very immediate. And, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Bromley, uh, nice to put a face to a disease, based on a disease. So uh, next, there's writing on the other side. Click. Okay. So, uh, and uh, the, part of the reason I like graphic medicine, I've read an over graphic memoirs, is that there's immediacy that you can, can have multiple narratives or you can have the internal states and then what's said and you can have manipulation of time with you know people staying and having a dot 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 or multiple multiple frames of the same thing to, to or you know changing up the color of the background <laughs> to indicate change the mood you can have, have many different ways to manipulate to the, the reality in this the space it's it's a really <clears throat> cool way to, to communicate and also you can have some humor too like there's some funny ones on the on the net Uh, next. So, you know, art has been a way many people have uh, used to, to process uh, things or, or to express themselves. So this uh, someone made a, I think it was made out of yarn, a, a brain and a you know, side profile of a head, um, you know, com combining nature with, uh, you know, the human heart. Um, on, on the right side there, that's a, a page from Stitches, which is a, a graphic memoir about uh, someone's experience with, uh, I believe it was laryngeal cancer. Uh, next slide. Um, sometimes uh, you can use uh, art to, you know, communicate and to share with others. So things like, uh, you know, respect and dignity for patients. So little lessons that you've put together and collecting them in this single graphic to communicate things like, you know, you know, cover your for patients. You know, don't interrupt it during exams. Um, you know, just just things that can help uh, make medical experience more more pleasant or more respectful and uh, really respect people's dignity. Next slide. So why why create? So like I said, the sublimation, the creative expression um, gives you perspective. Um, it's also, it's just 
sometimes fun to create and try different mediums. So I went for, from journal from journaling to blogging to poetry to and short narratives to calligraphy to some graphic medicine pieces. Um, some if you share these things, uh, the, it can be an advocacy. It can you know share important messages for you know upcoming trainees or you know try and influence cultural change and. Sometimes, you know, practice can just be more for mindfulness, gratitude, just uh, things from a more personal level. Next. So I'm gonna share a bit of my work. Um, so the first one is a graphic medicine piece. Uh, it's called Memento Mori. So uh, classically that's uh, reminders of death. Um, so I noticed that in medicine, we, we take a lot of things for granted. You know, the person that has, you know, a medication list that's a dozen things long and, you don't think about what the day-to-day -day realities of that. So um, I collected some pictures. A friend of mine helped uh, take pictures of a few other things, but uh, you know, someone wearing a CPAP mask, you know, having puffers at the bedside, the eye drops, the, the sugar checks, you know, the, the dosette for all your, your medications, you know, home BP, BP measurements, uh, the, the cabinet full of uh, medications. And you don't, you don't think about this, but you know, if you're someone who's not on, on medication or treatments or very little, this is an ongoing daily burden or daily reminder of, of, of illness, of uh, your own mortality. And that's, that's something that we sometimes overlook. Something, some, things like, uh, you know, go for your routine blood work. Like, you know, getting your INR done every four weeks is not pleasant, uh, but we, we kind of just think of it as so routine in medicine that we don't think about, you know, the inconvenience of going to the lab, of getting a painful uh, prick in the arm and then having your blood drawn and having that done, you know, 12 times a year or even more if you're changing the warfarin it's not nice <laughs> so uh next page um this so the next uh, two are actually from uh what i called my, my my burn book so I, at one point i got into a bit of a writer's block and i decided to change how i was writing so previously i'd uh, actually gathered a lot of thoughts uh spur of the moment i'd carry a pocketbook around when i was in the hospital or in doing things and have uh, random thoughts or a quote or, or a little ex experience. And I just jot a few things down and I, I collect these things and kind of put them all together. And uh, my writing, in general, my writing would be, I, I, I jokingly call it the constipation method. So if someone would bug me, it would brew in my mind and I'd sit down one evening and it all come out in one big block. Um, but at a certain point I, I kind of got stuck and I'm not sure why exactly. Um, but I picked up, I bought a small bound uh, book and it, I thought the, the uh, paper would be good for fountain pens and it was terrible. So I picked up a pencil and started writing with a pencil and because somehow because it was pen pencil and it could be erased and it didn't really matter that some things flowed out of me easier. So just as a, as a creative project, uh, as a creative process side of things. So uh, most of it, I had, I, in the end, most of that book, you know, it was uh, discarded, but a few things I, I kept around so just let me it's on my computer behind this screen so just give me one second to get that booted up so these are just very short ones so someone cares um to know someone cares that there's at least one other thinking of you makes a difference um that was inspired in part by a uh, a patient who had newly started treatment for uh, depression and then was lost to follow up and uh, I was concerned about them so I gave them a phone call and they were quite appreciative of that someone who has had them on their mind and had reached out to them so next uh, a goal and another very short and simple one uh, to be content for my family my patients myself a goal so very simple stuff next um, being there so this is a bit longer, but it's, it's kind of a follow-up to that uh, first piece I read about the crying doctor. And I didn't realize it at the time. It was only later that I realized that it was kind of the wrapping up that, that first piece. So, Daddy, time to wake up. It's morning time. I opened my, my eyes to our four-year-old daughter at the foot of the bed smiling, her hair meticulously braided. I get up and wake her younger brother from his crib and carry him downstairs. The baby is still sleeping. Soon come shouts of coffee, coffee, as we enter the kitchen. They know my routine well. After breakfast, we get dressed, I pack my daughter's lunch, and the three of us sit up for the trek to the bus stop. March 2nd marks one year since CARMS match day, and rather than being on call or spending time in the clinic, I'm on parental leave. On match day, I was at home playing with the kids and dancing to nursery rhyme songs. Partway through changing a diaper, my phone vibrated with a text from a classmate asking where I'd matched. 
I didn't realize results were posted. I checked and saw that I had matched to one of my top sites in family medicine, especially that would give me the flexibility to continue my involvement in the arts and in my children's lives. I quickly replied to the text and returned to dancing. The last year has been busy. The summer was spent searching for a new home, moving and welcoming another son in July. With three young children at home, I delayed starting residency until August. I began residency with four blocks of family medicine and was assigned to a busy group practice. Although the walk-in clinic and schedule, along with walk-in clinics and scheduled appointments, the office also did minor procedures and occasional house calls. I quickly connected with my preceptors and the staff over time gaining their trust. On my second day, I drove to a patient's house with a nurse after a patient didn't answer their phone call with a critically low hemoglobin on their blood work. Not all days were so exciting. Hi, Jonathan. Hi. That's the old house? Not quite. <laughs> So no. uh, let me get back to where I was. <laughs> Not all these are so exciting, but even an appointment for a cough would often develop into discussions about financial struggles or reveal caretaker burnout. I enjoyed my time in clinic and having great greater responsibility as a resident. I, I listened, often made patients smile or laugh, and on occasion held a hand or often offered a hug. Along with learning to care for others during medical school, I found a voice as a writer. Over time, I started sharing stories, articles, and poetry with others about medical culture, experiences of illness, and more. I was encouraged when my site director approached at a welcome event and began discussing my writing and continued involvement in the humanities during residency. With the support of my program, I attended the 10th annual The Examined Life Conference at the University of Iowa, where I learned and connected with others interested in medicine and the arts. Recently, I joined the staff of the Canadian Medical Association Journal as their humanities intern and have developed an interest in the ability to use graphic medicine to communicate experiences of illness. I'm excited to continue to deepen my involvement in the humanities during my medical career. I tried for, I tried over the four years of medical school to balance my home life with my training, but still I missed a lot. Our oldest son, our oldest was born as I started my training, a busy time transitioning to a new province. Luckily, I witnessed our second child's first footsteps occurring days after we returned from my residency interview tour. With the most recent addition, I found that finding a balance was even more difficult. After the birth of a child, residents have a one-year window to take leave. As I worked in the clinic, I started to consider, consider that opportunity. I knew that I wouldn't again have the chance for dedicated time with my family without the constant trickle of lab reports in my inbox and additional professional obligations. I knew that it also mean finishing residence later than I intended, but family comes first. When I first brought up the uh, opinion to my uh, option to a pre preceptor, I wasn't sure what to expect. Oh, gotta go, mommy's calling. Okay, night. Why did they have to stay quiet? Oh, can you, Jonathan, can you close the door? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I wasn't sure what reaction I would get when I uh, approached my preceptor. Uh, a part of me anticipated a negative reaction based on attitudes I'd come to expect in medicine, ones that uh, were staying after a call shift was a given and taking time off for illness was frowned upon. Instead, I found solid support from my preceptor, my program, and my mentors. In some cases, my choice was met with admiration and the wish that they had done the same when their children were young. After winter break, I had enough hours to qualify for unemployment benefits, and since January, I've been on leave continuing through July. In my career, I want to work with in the service of others, embrace the intersection of medicine and the arts, while being present as a loving husband and father. This last year, I've made the decision embracing these goals and for my specialty choice to deepen involvement in the humanities and taking leave. I know medicine is waiting for me come August. For now, I'm enjoying time at playgrounds, parks, planning family activities with my wife and hearing about my daughter's new friends that she and what she's learned after each day of school. So, yeah. So that kind of, you know, the first one I read was about the, you know, importance of family and about not missing out on these important things. And that one I was at, there was a opportunity to write uh, Carm's Reflections like one year after the match uh, for in training and, uh, or in house, I can't remember which version of their publications was, but, and uh, I put that together and I thought it was, uh, it kind of wrapped up that first uh, piece I had. Okay, next. Uh, this last one, is, is a poem that uh, was on my mind for, for a while and it's kind of an amalgamation of a few different patients. So um, for patient privacy reasons, obviously can't get, get, get the, you know, can't write someone's exact description and, and their stuff, you have to alter certain things. This is a amalgamation of a few people that uh, I met during a clerkship. Handsome cat, cocooned in her blanket. She asks again if I've seen the kitten's photo framed at her bedside. He's a big tabby now, and you should see his markings. You should see him now. He's such a handsome cat. 
All alone in a four bed ward, her youth stolen by tainted blood, now cancer invades her. All alone, no one visits. Oncology promises to assess her, no notes in the chart. They haven't come, we remind them once again. With each day, her will drains, she barely eats and it grows. Twice more we do our dance, as her walk, walker gathers dust, as hope fades. Have you seen him? You should see him now. You should see his markings. He's such a handsome cat. So, so that, that drew on a few amalgamated people. Uh, there was, you know, someone who had had a blood transfusion before they started screening Prep C and was very frustrated with the system. Someone with uh, ovarian cancer, and it, it was amalgamation of a few different people. But uh, it was just kind of stuck with me. This, uh, you know, lonely person without the connections and in hospital, and uh, kind of feeling like they're life was taken from them. So um, I, you may have noticed that a lot of my writings are not the happiest. <laughs> so uh, that's part of why I talk about processing and catharsis and um, delving into those emotions and how do you have an outlet? Because like I said, a lot of what we see is not, like there are some positive in medicine. There's some, you know, I get a lot of thank yous and stuff, but the things that seem to stick with you are oftentimes the negative outcomes or when, when you know, more could have been done um, or those difficult situations. Next slide. So it's important that we think about when we share these stories, um, they are told to us in confidence. We have a responsibility for being, you know, for how we use them, how we, how we share them, if we share them at all. Um, you know, we're, we're also only seeing a, a small slice of many people's lives. Like, we're, you know, we're doing it, we can do art about some encounter that you've had, but that doesn't mean that's the whole person. Um, you know, people aren't just the snapshot. Um, also, will, will sharing it have a hula benefit? Uh, are there any harms that could come from it? Um, also, no, it was hip, HIPAA issues. Um, you know, you, you know, if you can't say, well, I was in the room and I saw this 67-year-old, uh, uh, da, 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 like, you, you can't give a, a, a case where the person could read and say, hey, that's me. That, that's not allowed. <laughs> or using people's actual names, obviously. And you don't want to be exploitive. Like, you know, if you're using this to just to you know pad your your CV, it's it's not that shouldn't be the reason that you're publishing things. And also, you know, we have a, the, the public looks to us, so you know, I know people who've got in some trouble for you know sharing things on you know Facebook or Twitter or other things or you know, some people's TikToks. Uh, I think there was some what's it was some doctor recently slapped a patient's bum in the OR when someone was when they were on a, a live thing, and like that's totally inappropriate. So just being careful about you know. The, it, the public uh, has a trust in us, or at least, you know, a lot of them do. <laughs> but, but so anyway, so just be careful in terms of uh, what you're sharing and what are the motivations behind sharing things. Next slide. So just in, in going further into that, like uh, why and how is this is the story being told? Um, who who's the audience? Um, is it for the patients? Is it for other trainees? Um, is it just for your own self-aggrandizement uh, or is it like something you're trying to do something that's important for advocacy to drive change for social justice? Um, obviously, if you're getting paid to do it, that also brings to other things like why, why is someone paying you to tell these certain stories? Is there, is there some other motive? Uh, next. So a lot of my writing happened between uh, about second year of medicine and uh, my First, well, my residency was kind of broken up, but first, second year residency. Um, I'm now quite busy. I have three roles uh, as a attending. So I do ER, I do uh, CHC, I do RAN clinic. Um, I have uh, three kids, five, six, and nine. And uh, life's busy. It's, it's, there's a big learning curve when you enter practice. So, you know, going from, you know, doing rotations in a, you know, bigger emerge than a hospital that had more services to, Oh, I'm in a rural emerge. There is no OB, but people who are, need to deliver are showing up. There is no ortho here. You have to do all your own initial fracture management. There is no, et cetera, et cetera. So there's been quite a learning curve. So I have not had as much time to to write. Um, also, to be honest, uh, my, a lot of my pieces are are negative, and I don't really want to be having negative emotions sometimes. So um, I haven't been doing as much writing recently. I still journal, and uh, but one thing I have I do want to talk about is having some creativity in the moment. So uh, I have listened to oh, thousands of hours of talk radio, of improv comedy. Um, I you know loved uh, Who Li Who's Line growing up. Um, my friend you know bought me a nice subscription to Comedy Bang Bang, which is a improv comedy uh, weekly podcast. Uh, I, you know I, I I like 
the creating in the moment also had a you know a love of uh, freestyle hip hop, but I uh, won't get into that. So uh, I find that uh, you know using some improv techniques to be creative and connect in the moment with patients is a way to still have some creativity and stay human in my interactions. Next. Uh, part of the reason this works is because I am like, you know, in, in a frontline role, I'm doing eMERGE, I'm doing primary care, I'm doing addiction medicine. Um, I, I don't think this was, this would fit as well for a pathologist, but, uh, you know, I, I'm giving what I've, what I've tried and hopefully people find some, uh, some use in this. So uh, being in the roles I am, anything and everything shows up at my doorstep. Um, so you have to be able to react to that, uh, be in the moment, be present and uh, notice small things. Um, I often find that, you know, 10 or 15 seconds of, of humor to connect with, uh, with patients in the eMERGE uh, can make a big difference in terms of uh, the history and, you know, uh, getting it, you know, they're, they're trusting me in terms of my, my diagnosis or my, my thoughts, and my uh, return instructions. And uh, improv, you have to have a lot of trust in yourself. You have to be able to, like, to go with people, to be present, to, to trust yourself. And just as some silly examples, like I've had conversations with parents and kids about Doc McStuffins. I've talked about Owlette and uh, Gecko and uh, P the PJ Masks. Um, I've had, uh, you know, we had, a, we had a little riffing about Dr. Pimple Popper with people. I work in a rural environment, so I've talked a bunch about hunting, fishing, fly fishing, uh, things like that. Um, one important thing is if you're going to use humor, you can joke about the absurdity of the situation. You never have the patient as the butt of the joke. Uh, next. So uh, this is a little comic piece, testing whether the laughter is the best medicine. So uh, yeah, pointing and laughing at the patient is not what I'm talking about in terms of humor. I, I'm talking about, you know, making lighter of the situation, being serious when you need to be serious, but being there and being able to react in the moment shows people that you're listening. Um, there's a uh, gentleman in the States, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Shea, who works with veterans. And uh, he even gives the advice in terms of people who are rotating through, because he's working with veterans who are you know, applying for, who've been through a whole lot. And he's like, the veterans will never respect you or trust you if you are purely objective and just going down the criteria list. Um, you know, he's, he gives advice to people that, you know, if you feel like vomiting, vomit. If you need to weep, weep. The veterans will respect you for it because it means you're really listening and seeing the, the pain that they've been through. I'm not advising you to break down in tears with every encounter, but being present and having emotions is important. And it shows that you're a human, that you're there, and that you're with the patient. So next. So one of the books that I have uh, recommended to a few medical students before was called Improv Wisdom. It's a series of lessons that... Uh, Patricia Madsen has drawn from their time doing improv. Um, the subtitle is uh, Don't Prepare to Show Up. I, I, I do recommend that you prepare and, and study. <laughs> uh, don't, you know, you, you are expected to know medicine and, and uh, you know, be able to diagnose things and treat things, things like that. But um, improv, it's, uh, you know, being present, having to trust in yourself, uh, you know, knowing that you have the tools to interact that you if you're a human they're human you you can talk to this person don't don't be scared and taking it easy is is one where don't take yourself self too seriously so some situations you you have to be like i don't you never start joking during a resuscitation um but you know when when you're able to like be able to have an anecdote make an observation like there's a number a bunch of times that i've had people that you know they they're, don't want to open up right at all but i notice some fur on their, their coat and I ask them about their dog and that's all it takes to open people up and have a, a good conversation with them and get the history that you need and, and move forward with things. So it also means you can bring yourself. I know we're kind of taught to be very objective in medicine and you know, what's the odds ratio of, you know, of, uh, different physical exam maneuvers and uh, things like that. Um, but you, you can still bring yourself to a situation. You don't need to be Spock and, you know, have no emotions. You, you can, bring you know share anecdotes I wouldn't say share everything about yourself because you, you know you don't want to you know be oversharing but you you can share through knowing uh, you know through the things that you've experienced through commonalities through you, through you're talking about cars or whatever the person is into and you know being a human is, is very important like one of the top things that people say about is like why do you like your doctor well my doctor listens to me 
and being present and using some improv things, the yes and, and not only that, but, and going with people, doesn't have to be extensive, doesn't have to be 20 minutes, but it makes a difference. By not just going by the, you know, diagnostic criteria and exploring a bit, you can learn more about your patients and it makes medicine more fun. Like, I, I, one thing I've really regretted about COVID is that I have to wear a gown and gloves and a, 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 a N95 and a mask with a visor and a hair in it. It's very hard to do physical comedy when you're dressed up like that. Like, you don't have facial expressions. It's, it's not the same. Um, and it's harder to judge other people's reactions with, with, with that stuff on. So I'd say the, initially my, my career was easier to do some of the improv stuff because before these uh, extra PPE requirements were, were in place. But uh, yeah, I would recommend, you know, look into this. Uh, if, if you're someone who's really nervous about clinical encounters, you know, doing, some, doing a bit of improv or reading about it could be really useful for getting more comfortable. Anyway, next. So I was gonna end with a, a narrative medicine exercise. It's, it's pretty common, perhaps you've done it before. Um, so a lot of us, like I said, through, through schooling, we haven't done any creative writing for, for years. Um, there might be some reflections that you've had to do as part of your medical training. Um, but I was hoping if people are willing that we could do a little uh, writing exercise. So, you know, pen and pa paper, or pencil, on a computer, whatever you like. Um, you know, writing for about eight minutes. Uh, I don't know if you can put a timer on uh, once you start. And so just write something it's from your life. Tell as you would to a friend. Next. So if people do want to share at the end, uh, you know, mutual respect, don't interrupt during the person's reading. Um, you know, it's, you can have comments or questions about for clarity or exploring meaning or how things were told, but uh, it's not about being critical of that, what they wrote. It's about uh, exploring what they wrote. And uh, if they don't want to answer them, that's fine. Um, I had this previously as a share in pairs thing. You, you can scratch that out, sorry. <laughs> and uh, if no one wants to share that, that's fine. Um, next. So uh, the, the prompt, just wrapping back to that first slide, was uh, just tell me about a time in your life you felt grateful. So if you want to set a timer, then uh, we'll reconvene in about uh, eight minutes. So just before uh, nine o'clock my time and I guess seven o'clock mountain time. Okay. Okay. So I wasn't sure, did anyone feel that they wanted to share? If not, I can, I, I wrote something too, so I can share something if you like, but... Uh, yeah, I didn't know what anyone else wanted to share. I can share mine. Sure. I don't know how good it is. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it goes like this. Uh, Visitors are not allowed in the ICU, said the attendant outside the big ward where my grandmother was. She'd been well till two days ago. I don't know what happened. She was coughing and now she was here. I pleaded with the attendant. I'm leaving the country tonight. Please let me say the night and goodbye. He agreed, seeing the worry on my face. I went in, hugged my grandmother. It would be the last time I did that as she passed away three days later. It has been two years. Uh, sorry. <laughs> and rarely do a few weeks go by that I do not think about saying goodbye or the attendant's kindness. I get to remember my grandmother as she was, always more concerned about the well-being of the person beside her. Um, than her own. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I knew I should never have heard about this. <laughs> oh, no. no, it happens. It, it, like, I don't know if you, you noticed, but uh, during a couple of my pieces, I got a little bit uh, teary as well. So it's a uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry. Um, uh, I'll, I'll share my mind's more general. So uh, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to explore some long-standing interests I've had through family medicine. Uh, addiction was uh, something I've been interested in ever since I, I listened to the uh, to Love Line, which is an old radio show uh, growing up. And it's been wonderful to be able to uh, be part of the founding of a clinic. Also the chance to do Emerge, which is something that I enjoyed during undergrad, but I wasn't sure if I was the right fit. Uh, I was, uh, it was great to be mo mon mentored into this field. And uh, now that I'm there being appreciated by those I work with and it, it's uh, been great. Also, I, I'm grateful that I've been able to find a balance uh, between my you know, family and my, my work. And 
being being present there as a as a father. So, so more general, but uh, yeah. Anyone else want to want to share or any comments? I'll share mine. Sure. Okay, I am so grateful. I found the casts from my time at Ortho. I was a teenager when these casts were made. I didn't I didn't uh, edit this so. Um, they horrified me. I was disgusted and felt a bit sick to my stomach seconds before a wave of gratitude for my parents. My parents who could have done so much with the cost of the metal required to fix my very crooked teeth. My life to date flashed before me the significant events that without a doubt never could have been possible if the teeth I was holding were still in my mouth. Things like my personality, positivity, and humor, my career in the dental field, my relationship, which led to my two amazing kids. Mom, dad, I'm ever grateful. Well, thanks everyone for sharing and for participating. It's, uh, it's, uh, so maybe this will prompt you to you know, do more, more writing or you know, delve deeper into those uh, things you shared in, in the future and uh, thank you very much for, for sharing next uh next <laughs> so um just to summarizing what i've talked about today you know uh we're involved in high stress careers we see things that uh many that, you know really no one else sees and we're have windows into people's lives and they're suffering that others don't um, oftentimes, if the families might see, see it, but uh, you know we see it again and again across many different people. Um, and you need, you need to have some way to uh, to deal with that, um, to stay emotionally present, to uh, process events. And uh, in my case, I found that uh, creation of art, uh, you know, involvement in a project, these have been ways to um, deal with those stresses and uh, to, to move through them and to grow as a person. Uh, there's many modalities so you know if writing's not your thing you know comics art song there's you know make a web web comic uh you know there, there's uh many different ways to uh to do things and uh finding something that works, works for you um also sometimes you know sharing them can be important if there's an important message there uh, but just be mindful of uh the motivations behind sharing things and uh the confidentiality that for our patients Next. And uh, I want some thank yous. Uh, Dr. Nisker is uh, my, my writing mentor. Uh, Dr. Nance for uh, connecting me with this, this group. Um, Dr. Zazalak, I did a uh, enhanced elective in residency, um, looking at uh, some uh, seminal papers in uh, narrative medicine, uh, the McMaster Writing Group, and uh, drew on some of the work of uh, Dr. Peterkin, Charon, and uh, Used during this talk, and uh, in the words of uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, make good art. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dewick. Before we conclude this presentation, would everyone mind just sticking around for a little bit? Manisha has a few words to say as we wrap up our um, seminar for this term. Uh, I think there was a question in the chat about uh, more specifics with regards to improv techniques and. It's more about just responding to what what's given and being present and noticing things. Uh, just like I said, you know, noticing the hair on someone's, you know, pants and asking about their pets, or um, you know, just treating people as humans and then you know, going with what they give you and not not blocking with it. If they share something, um, you know, you can go a bit further. You see a certain shirt they're wearing, or they make a certain comment, and just going a few steps down that road can really help. It only takes. 15, 20 seconds oftentimes, but it makes a big difference in terms of their feeling like they've been heard and that you're 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 there with them. Not you're not up in your head going through Wells criteria all the time or or whatever algorithm you're running to try and you know categorize their their condition. Um, you know, you're like I said, you're you're human and you're you're present. But uh, I, I will say that when I was a kid, I didn't realize that it takes a pretty wide base of knowledge to be able to do improv. Like you think, well, watch who's lying. Oh, these people are funny and this and that, like they're doing improv comedy. But to be able to riff on different ideas or what, what you're presented, you have to have a trust in yourself. You also need to have a pretty wide knowledge base to be able to, to you know, pick up on whatever they're throwing your way, so. 
and I'm not talking about just BSing people, I mean, being genuine in, in, in these interactions. Thank you, Dr. Duick. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again for everyone um, for making the time tonight. And uh, I also just wanted to say thank you. This is, as many people know, um, our last session for season three of Obliquity. And so we've enjoyed the last year and all of the um, different seminars that we've had this year. And I just wanted to let everyone know that we are in the process of planning our next season of events that will kick off in August. Um, we have a physician poet, uh, Dr. Shane Nielsen, that will be joining us in August to talk about one of his new poetry collections. Um, and our new season will be called Techne or Craft. And so a lot of the sessions will be focusing on different aspects related to that. And at some point over the summer, um, take a look at your emails. We will be doing another apparel fundraiser at some point as well. We're working with a, a medical student artist at the moment to put some pieces together. Um, and if you ever have any questions over the next few months while we're on break, uh, always feel free to reach out to us and all the recordings remain on our website. I'll get this one edited and that one will be posted up there as well. So thank you again, everyone, and we hope to see you next year.